Welcome to Thursdays for the Soul. This is a predictable time of gathering each week at this time that we can be together and care for our souls. Our topics are wide ranging and we focus on spirituality and the care of people. Prayer, worship, music, and psalm readings or compassionate teachings are often included. I am Reverend Dr. Chris Davies, and I am happy to host this webinar on mysticism and mindfulness. And there is never a more appropriate time that we are focused on how to care for our souls and be centered and grounded in that care. So by way of introduction for the folks who are here with us today, I'm gonna to invite each guest to introduce themselves and speak to their journey about how they got to mysticism or mindfulness as a place of landing. Greetings. My name is Reverend Dr. John Myers, and I am an Associate Conference Minister for the Southern Conference, and also founder of Fruit of the Spirit Life. And the mission of that is to share spiritual practices that heal and transform. And so greetings to you, Chris, and our panelists. Uh, I want to start with how did I get here? I got here, started in 2008. Uh, I got sick, was pastoring a small church in Suffolk, Virginia, trying to be everything to everybody. Uh, at every bedside, I was uh, involved in justice work. I was involved in conference work. I was involved in association work. And uh, I got sick and I started having these dizzy spells. Well, that led me to the emergency room and uh, they found a lesion on my brain. Uh, so to, to make a long story short, I was sent to a neurologist and the neurologist um, said that I had multiple sclerosis. At the same time, my skin started breaking out. I couldn't swallow. I mean, I just had so many things going on. I had five doctors at one time trying to figure out what was going on and I was in despair. And I got on my knees one night and I prayed. I said, Lord, help me. And God sent me not to another doctor, but God sent me to a support group uh, where I relearned uh, the practice of meditation and prayer. What was interesting is that over time, I noticed that those symptoms started to subside. I, I didn't want to take any medicine. And so over with, within a year, all of the symptoms had just disappeared. And the doctors were like, this is a miracle. And I'm still being seen today. But in 12 years, I've been symptom free. So in that time, I really dove into prayer spiritual practices, Zen, Buddhism, the Eightfold Path, all of these different ways, centering prayer, uh, yoga, Tai Chi, Qi Kung, and came up with a methodology that, um, that I could continue on. And then in 2015, founded Fruit of the Spirits Light, which would be a way to share these spiritual practices that heal and transform. Um, and so that been around the conferences, did a lot of work with uh, our own conference in the Southern Conference and workshops. And so really it has just been a blessing and continue to share that work, uh, writing for our conference and writing my first book, which will be spiritual practices and self-care in times of crisis. So uh, that's uh, how I got here. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of this panel and sharing uh, in this time together. Hi, I am Reverend Shannon Abbott, and I specialize in ministries of health and wholeness with a background in clinical social work and with additional training in yoga, massage, Reiki, energy work, um, and aromatherapy. And so my primary focus um, in ministry is on stress reduction, emotional balance, and spiritual renewal, trying to put us back together into the whole person that God intends us to be. Um, I came to mindfulness um, by way of yoga 
in a time in my life when I was feeling very disconnected and um, I was working in social work at the time as um, in mental health and addictions. And what I was finding is that in social work, we worked with the mind. In church, we focused on the spirit. And at the gym, they focused on the body, but there wasn't any place <laughs> to focus on the whole person. And um, I did find that on my yoga mat. Um, I remember one day in particular, I was, um, I was in a mindfulness practice with my yoga teacher. And um, I don't remember what she said, <laughs> but, um, and I wish I could, but whatever she said in that moment of stillness, in that moment when my mind was open to the spirit's leading, I heard exactly what I needed to hear and I felt myself reconnect. It was like something inside of me clicked and all those pieces that were separated were then together. And I was whole again, as God intended me to be. And from that moment on, I said, everyone needs this. Everyone needs to find wholeness in their lives again. Why do we have something that focuses on this and something that focuses on this and something that focuses on this? And why is the church not focusing on wholeness and on making sure that people are the whole people that God wants us to be? And um, I'm glad to see that more churches are starting to do that, um, but it is still um, fairly rare. So, um, so mindfulness has made a huge difference in my life. Um, I think it's a huge part of being whole and being who God intends us to be. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, John. My name is John Dorhauer. I currently serve as General Minister and President of the United Church of Christ. And in answering the question, how did I get here? I'm gonna walk you back, backwards quickly through my life's journey. When I was elected a little over five years ago to serve in this position, the most bold statement I made to the church at the time was the Holy Spirit and visions of future in which you matter. For the 12 years that I worked in conference ministry, uh, prior to be, being elected to serve in this position, every time I would meet with a search committee, the first words I would share with them were, the Holy Spirit is your greatest ally in this process. On the day that my wife and I were married, we had a passage of scripture read from the 24th chapter of Joshua. And uh, the passage was, Choose this day whom you will serve, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And at every point in our life's journey, we've taken time to pray with each other to discern the call of God on our lives and the movement of the Holy Spirit, sending us to places not of our choosing, but of her choosing. And I learned to do all of that, having spent eight years in a Catholic seminary before I entered Eden Theological Seminary as a Lutheran student, not as a United Church of Christ a potential candidate for ministry. In those eight years that I spent in the Catholic Church, I had a spiritual director. Every um, month we would cancel classes for a day and spend the day in prayer with one another. Five times a day we would gather in community for prayer or for liturgy. Every year we would go on a retreat and at least once a month, I would spend a couple of hours with my spiritual director. And I learned through those eight years to cultivate a deep relationship with the Holy Spirit who is the lifeblood of the church. And I quite frankly don't know how to uh, endure the work of ministry or continue to look with hope to the future without relying on the movement of God's Holy Spirit who has not abandoned us in this time nor in any time and who is always as close to us as our next breath. My name is Reverend Brendan Curran. I'm the pastor of Forest Grove UCC in Forest Grove, Oregon. And I also, to start um, to explain my journey with mysticism, I have to go back really early to when I was a little kid. I'm the child of an Irish immigrant and um, 
Chris, you reached out to me and said, Brendan, I'm re I want you to be here on the panel because you're a Celtic mystic. So I guess that uh, if that's true, uh, I, uh, it, the journey started uh, early. Um, I was, so one side of my family are Gaelic Irish Catholic immigrants and uh, the other side are liberal Christians. So I grew up being taken to mass by my grandma once a week. Uh, going to Catholic school, but on Sundays my family would attend um, the United Church of Christ Church. And uh, really my spiritual teacher growing up was uh, my grandmother in a lot of ways. And the Christianity that I learned from her was imbued with the sense of God being uh, the life, the love, the light all around us and within us. And as I explored and questioned religion more, um, having all of that theological backing and con different contexts to ask questions, I became um, impatient with or less interested in a doctrinal understanding of God and more interested in wondering how do we embody uh, the wisdom of Christ? How do we actually embody and experience the wisdom of Christ? And that led to an exploration of spiritual practices that help us do that. Um, th that questioning also uh, began with my rejection of much of organized Christian institutions as a gay person as I came, and as a uh, member of the queer community as I came into uh, that identity. Um, I just didn't have much patience or use for uh, organized religious institutions, but I found supportive practices in Buddhism. And I discovered Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, I lived and practiced at the Cambridge Zen Center for seven years. And uh, uh, I became a Dharma teacher in the Quantum School of Zen. And living in that environment, I also learned about mysticism and learned that the um, what I learned about God from my grandmother actually was uh, a Celtic mysticism and I rediscovered in that environment and through that practice my appreciation for um, the indwelling uh, love and liberation of God which we know as the Christ. Brendan, Gaurav Mahaguch. Uh, for those of you watching now or later, that's how to say thank you in Irish. <laughs> oh, there are so many practices of mindfulness. And one of the ones that is near universal is a practice of sitting in silence um, and a practice of being attentive um, in our spirits and in our souls to that which is in, in important and um, that which is necessary for our, co for our attention. So uh, in the United Church of Christ, we have members who are part of NAACC and we have, um, and we support and stand alongside what they are doing. And they have issued a collective call that today at 345 Eastern, which is in about one minute, um, we sit in silence and, and in meditation um, for the justice for George Floyd for eight minutes and 46 sec seconds. So um, we will do that on this call. And um, at the other side of that, we're gonna talk about why this matters. Why does it matter that we are clinging to these practices and using them and infusing them into everything that we are doing for the work of the church and for the work of the movement. So please join us in meditating join us in the spiritual practice of silence and be attentive and imaginative to the world where no more people will unnecessarily die because of the color of their skin, their wealth, their class, their access, their where they live or any other reason. No more death. Be with us.
Hear me now? Why does it matter? It matters because a colleague once told me you can't pour from an empty cup. And the psalmist says in 46.10, be still and know that I'm God. And that is the foundation for all of these practices for me is being still, I refill that cup over and over and over again. And it connects me to the risen Christ who resides within, not in the past mind, not in the future mind, but in the now, in the present. I believe that's why when you hear the, what it says about Noah, Noah found favor with God because Noah walked with God. And it's staying present. And in that presence, you experience connecting with Christ, connecting to his joy, connecting to his peace, connecting to his love, connecting to his healing, connecting to his abundance. That's what I found and why it's important. I was doing too much doing and not enough being. So be still and know that I'm God. And when I got to pitch this to uh, Reverend Barber, we were at Franklinton Center, we were talking about his 10 state revival at that time. I got to pitch it at, for Reverend Barber, Reverend Yvonne Delk, uh, Reverend Jim Forbes and his brother David, who was uh, the seminary, he was the one of the professors at Shaw. And Reverend Barber, after I pitched Fruit of the Spirits, he said, John, this is what we need for the movement. He said, we need spiritual and spiritual practice so that we have clarity, that we continue to fill up, that we have power, that we have resiliency. That's what it, that's what happens. That's what we need. He said, we need a refilling, otherwise we'll get burnt out and uh, maybe sick. So that's why we need it. That's why it's important to continue to fill up that cup so that we have the power, Holy Ghost power to move forward. Shannon, why for you is this so important? Yeah, so mindfulness has been described um, as deliberately paying attention to the present moment without judgment. And I think that that is really important right now in this moment, in, the, in this present. It's, it's important in every present, but I think especially right now, with just everything going on, you know, we've been at home for months and now we're out on the streets um, for justice. And um, I think just with everything going on, now more than ever, we need mindfulness. Um, we can be more present in our bodies with mindfulness. We can be more present in our mind through our thoughts and emotions. And it helps us in our spiritual life as well. Um, for me, what mindfulness does is that it helps to quiet all the chatter. And I know that I've heard a lot of people talking about the mind chatter. I can't sleep at night. I can't focus during the day, right? <laughs> and, um, and so I think that mindfulness is something that everybody's looking for right now. Um, between COVID and the murder of black and brown people, we are all stressed to the max. And mindfulness can offer some internal support to help us cope with those stressors. But mindfulness isn't just about reducing stress. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna minimize its effects. Um, through the practice of mindfulness, through deliberately paying attention to the present moment without judgment, um, we make space for discernment. And that's really important right now in the work that we do. Discernment about where we're needed most and, dis and discernment about how the spirit is guiding us into action. So mindfulness can help to quiet the chatter leaving room for us to listen to the spirit's guidance. 
So for me, that is, that is the biggest thing that I am benefiting from right now with mindfulness. So in terms of me, why does this matter? I'm gonna say something broadly sweeping that might be universally true, but isn't always particularly true. And then I'm gonna give a very specific example of um, how this has manifested itself as truth in the world in which I walk. For 500 years, the enlightenment asked us and taught us and conditioned us to live in our head. And the belief was that scientific, rational, logical thought would help us uncover the deep hidden truths of the universe and move us further and further and further closer to some identic existence. And if we couldn't measure it, couldn't touch it, couldn't examine it under a microscope and write about it, it, it wasn't truth or it didn't exist. And I believe in rational thought and reason and logic. I, God gave us a mind as a gift and, and we're called to use it. But for those 500 years, we lost the art of cultivating the intuitive, that which we feel but cannot know, that which we experience but cannot explain. And we wanted it all explained. Um, and God doesn't often or always communicate only through the intellect. And, and so the only way that the world and our bodies open up fully to what God intended them to be is to create a healthier balance between the body, the mind, the heart, the soul, and the spirit. All of that is gift. Um, and the particular example, I, I have this uncanny ability to walk into a space and know whether or not there's a spiritual awakeness there or a spiritual sort of um, drudgery. And one of the churches I served, when I walked into it, I, I could just feel the dead space in the room. And literally the third week that I was there, my sermon began with, this is a wonderful church filled with wonderful people, many of whom can't stand one another, and you are spiritually dead. And I said, I'm inviting us onto a journey where for the next, I don't know, is it year, two year, three years, we're going to learn to pray with one another. Um, you've, I said, you called me here as an evangelist, but I can't do that work because the house is not in order. And I don't want people to feel the dis-ease that I feel when I walk into this space. And, and so we did six weeks every spring and every fall where we just taught a different art of prayer. And I remember that when that sermon finished, an 84-year-old man came up to me and said, John, I've been a member of this church my whole life. And he was weeping. He wept through the sermon. And he said, I'm 84. Nobody's ever taught me how to pray. Um, and someday I'll, I'll finish the story of what those, what became three years of committing to be in prayer with one or another led to. Um, I'll just briefly say that, and this is a much longer story. I found myself one night in a hospital room where my daughter was not expected to live through the night. And I went into the corner and started praying and I made three phone calls. I called the man I identify as my spiritual father. I called my mother and I called the moderator of that church and invited them to pray. And when the moderator answered the phone, she said, John, we're already here. My daughter lived through the night. I have no doubt because of the prayers that were being lifted up that night. But this, the part of the story I want you to hear is that after three years of taking that journey, she and the members of that church knew that their role that night was to be in that chapel, in that sanctuary with one another in prayer, hundreds of miles away from where I was with my daughter. It matters. Brad, <laughs> I'm having I, all, all of, um, uh, I am mindfully present to all of this. And I find that when I'm mindfully present, my emotions come up to the surface in different ways. Um, Brendan, why does it matter for you? 
I think it matters because uh, God is not an object, but a verb. Uh, God is a life in which we participate. Uh, the Celtic mystic uh, uh, and poet John O'Donohue talks about God is the life in which we participate, the great circle of belonging. And if that's true, we have to ask, we, we get to ask deeper questions about who we are. And when we do, uh, we, the expression of our awareness of God becomes uh, engaged with the transformation and upliftment of ourselves and also of our world. We step into the collective. And I wanna give an example of how in uh, when the Gales landed in Ireland, according to the Celtic myths, they burst into song saying, I am the wind on the sea. I am the wave of the sea. I am the bull of the seven battles. I am a flash of the sun. I am the most beautiful plains. I am the salmon in the water. I am the word of knowledge. I am the head of the spear in the battle. Who spreads light in the gathering on the hills? Who can tell the ages of the moon? So, uh, mystical spirituality invites us to ask this question, who are we, and answer them um, in concert with all forms of, answer it with not an answer about ourselves, but access the part of ourselves that is what in Zen, I guess they would call the big self, that circle of belonging, that life in which we participate. And of course, this is rooted in Christian tradition as well. We hear it in the Acts of John when Christ says, I will dance and I will be danced. I will sing and I will be sung. I will eat and I will be eaten. And of course, we also, and this is where it gets to the resistance part, the mindfulness. We see Thich Nhat Hanh, who's the great mindfulness teacher and Buddhist peace activists also offer us some I am statements. He says, uh, look deeply every second. I'm arriving to be a bud on a spring branch, to be a tiny bird with still fragile wings, learning to sing in my new nest, to be a caterpillar in the heart of a flower, to be a jewel hidden in a stone. And he also says, goes on to say, but I am also the child in Uganda, all skin and bones my legs as thin as bamboo sticks, and I am the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Uganda. So mysticism enters this realm of resistance. In her book, The Silent Cry, Mysticism and Resistance, Dorothy Soul talks about what mystical spirituality looks like, will look like today. And I just wanna offer her quote, and she says, uh, mystical spirituality of creation will very likely move deeper and deeper into the dark night of being delivered into the hands of the principalities and powers that dominate us. For it is not only the poor man from Nazareth who is tortured together with his brothers and sisters on the cross. It is our mother earth herself and all humanity. The horizon of ecological catastrophe is the backdrop before which today's road of the mystical journey has to be considered. To praise God and to miss, miss nothing so much as God leads to, leads to a life in God that the tradition calls via unitive, unitiva. To become one with what was intended in creation has the shape of co-creation. To live in God means to take an active part in the ongoing creation. And so it matters because this awareness calls us to live as though we are already in the realm of God and to live for the realm of God. And we see that in the children who I saw, who I joined with, the thousands in the streets of Portland, lying down, face down on the ground for nine minutes with their hands behind their back, embodying empathy, saying, uh, I can't breathe. In this, uh, um, and the Irish activist Bernadette Devlin, my sign at the protest said, uh, we were born into an oppressive racist colonizing system, but we refuse to grow old in it. And if we're going to uh, embody the new world that's possible, we all need to be able to say, I can't breathe when one of us can't breathe. And then we'll breathe a new world into being together. Amen. And, and that's that's what Dorothy Soul calls the the silent cry, which we all just practice together for eight minutes. 
Oh, lest you who are watching now or in the recording think that we would hold the session on mindfulness and not include practices and tips and tools for you, we're going to move into offering some of those practices in the last few, in the last 20 minutes of our time together. Um, and hope and bless you into using them. We hope and we bless you into reaching towards that which you need to equip yourself for this work now. Um, there, to lead in this time, to be in this time, is to be alongside a, a set of circumstances that's compounded and compounded and like none other in the history um, that we have access to in living memory. Um, with that reality, um, we need these tools and tips. We need these, we need these. So um, open your heart, open your mind, lean into spirit and witness alongside the offerings of the folk who are wisdom leaders in this call. Brendan, are you ready to help lead us in? Oh, sure. Um, well, I uh, I talked about those two I am statements and the Jesus's I am statements in the Acts of John. Also, I am the, he says, I am the true vine. I am the light. I am the, we can all answer the power of this understanding of being in, in God is we can answer that question, what am I with these same I am statements. And we see the blending of the two understandings in the Irish prayer called St. Pat Patrick's Breastplate, which is also known as the deer's cry. And I would just like to offer this prayer that expresses this understanding of we being in God and God being within us. And I'd like that prayer, this prayer to be, I recite this as a prayer of sh a shield. It's the prayer itself is called a shield. Uh, it's a protection prayer, and I'd like to say it for all of us in these times, um, a shield of protection around our hearts, and I would like to envision uh, this, say this prayer is a shield of protection around all those who are facing police brutality and all those who are rising up for justice across this country. So I'd like to recite now St. Patrick's Breastplate. We arise today through the mighty strength and in the invocation of the Holy Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. We arise today through the strength of Christ's birth with his baptism, through the strength of his crucifixion with his burial, through the strength of his resurrection and his ascension, through the strength of his descent for the judgment of doom. We arise today through the strength of the love of angels, in the obedience of angels, in the service of archangels, in the hope of resurrection to meet justice, in the prayers of our mothers and our fathers, in the visions of prophets, in the preaching of the apostles, in the faith of confessors, in the power of women, in the deeds of the just, we arise today through all the power and strength of heaven, the light of the sun, the radiance of the moon, the splendor of the fire, the speed of lightning, the swiftness of wind, the depth of the sea, the firmness and stability of the earth and of rock. We arise today through God's strength to pilot us and guide us, God's might to uphold us, God's wisdom to guide us, God's eye to look before us, God's ear to hear us, God's word to speak for us, God's hand to guard us, God's shield to protect us, God's heavenly host to save us from snares of the devils, from temptation of vices, from everyone who shall wish us ill afar and near. We summon today all these powers between us and those evils against every cruel and merciless oppressive power that may oppose bodies and souls, against the incantations of false prophets, against the laws 
uh, against unjust laws, against the false laws, against against all forms of idolatry and let all let christ be with me before me behind me in me below me above me christ on my left christ on my right christ when i lie down christ when i sit down christ when i arise christ in the heart of every man or woman or person who thinks of me Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. We arise today through that mighty strength, the invocation of the most holy trinity, through the belief in the threeness, through the confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. Amen. Brandon, thank you. Um, as a, I often call myself a closet mystic. As a closet mystic, I can't tell you what an honor and a privilege it is uh, to discover fellow mystics on the journey and to be fed by you, even as I'm a part of this presentation. So Brendan, John, Shannon, thank you so much. I'm going to do a really quick thing and then walk you through a prayer exercise that I practice often with a piece of poetry that has come to be a companion on my journey for quite some time now. But I do want to quote Thich Nhat Hanh, Brendan having referenced him. My favorite line from Thich Nhat Hanh is, sometimes my joy is the source of my smile. At other times, my smile is the source of my joy. It is a way of saying that we can choose to walk through the world with a particular orientation towards what we experience. And I often remind myself when feeling tense or stress or under pressure to smile. And in simply doing so to reorient myself to what's happening around me so that I don't contribute to the weight of another. Sometimes my joy is the source of my smile. At other times, my smile is the source of my joy. For me, one of the pathways to spiritual enrichment is language. And whether that's through the language of a hymn or a piece of music and the lyrics or poetry, I often use those as a gift to guide me on my journey. I'm going to recite what is a, a companion of a piece of poetry from my favorite poet that I keep a copy of by my desk and, and recite every day as a reminder to how I want to walk in the world. It's a short poem, so I'll read it once and then I'll recite it a second time with just a little bit of silence uh, in, in between each of the lines, giving you an opportunity for the spirit to visit you in unexpected ways as you hear the language. The poem is written by Emily Dickinson and it, it, it reads this way. I had no time for hate, the grave would hinder me. For life is not so ample, I can finish enmity nor had I time for love. But since some industry must be, my little toil of love, I deem, is large enough for me. I'm gonna recite that again with silence between each of the lines. I had no time for hate. The grave would hinder me. For life is not so ample. that I could finish enmity. Nor had I time for love.
but since some industry must be my little toil of love, I deem. is large enough for me. Amen. The practice always comes back to the breath for me. Um, and so I want to invite us into a time of mindful breath practice of remembrance. And in this practice, I'm going to say some of the names of just a few of the black and brown people who have been murdered recently. I'm also gonna offer a time for you to breathe without the names. And so if there are others in your community that are not named, or others in your memory who are not named, then I invite you to fill those in. So I invite you to begin by placing your right hand on your heart and your left hand on your belly. And we're gonna feel the movement of the breath from the belly all the way up to the collarbone and back down again, inhaling, and exhaling. And continuing this breath in and out, in and out. As you notice the easy rhythm of your breath, breathing in and breathing out. We remember black and brown people in our country, in our communities. These children of God murdered and left without breath. Remember as you inhale. Remember as you exhale. Inhale, Ahmaud Aubrey. Exhale. Inhale, Brianna Taylor. Exhale. Inhale. George Floyd, exhale. Inhale, David McAtee, exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. And remember. Amen.
First of all, I want to thank uh, my fellow panelists, uh, John and Shannon, Brendan, uh, for and Chris and all of the support staff for this opportunity to just share in this moment. Thank you so very much. Um, I wrote this piece about a week ago for uh, our conference. It is called uh, Grandma's Hands. And this was you know, a song that came to me uh, from the, the great late Bill Withers talked about grandma's hands and how those hands are soothing and, and help us in, our, in many, many times. And so this meditation was uh, devised around the idea of grandma's hands that Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, the Christ within is only a breath away. And we can always connect at any moment to his power, to his abundance, to his love, to his hope, to his peace by just putting our hands together. So I'd invite you to put your hands together and just as Shannon has so eloquently shared with us, the breath. Everything is in the breath. It's how we connect to Christ within. Breathe in, out. See your breath moving in, out. Breathe in, out. And as you breathe in, I want you to be mindful, focus in here, in, out, in, out. Bring attention to your body in out out now just bask in the peace and the stillness of almighty god in, out, be still and know that I'm God, amen. Amen. Oh, siblings and sisters and brothers in Christ, if this has mattered to you, if the Work that we are doing here has helped equip you for your journey. And if you have something to give to continue to support this work, you can do so by texting UCC to 41444 and give in to the annual fund, which will continue to support programs like this. It is because of you that we are able to do this. And I want to let you know what's upcoming in these series as well. On Tuesday, we will be joined by Bishop Barber and Dr. Theo Harris, Sandy Sorensen, and uh, as led by uh, Reverend Tracy Blackman, talking about the urgency of now and our work alongside the Poor People's Campaign. A week from today, we will gather and pay attention to, is it safe to sing? on the streets, in our buildings, in our worship, on our screens. Is it safe to sing? And you can listen in and join alongside by going to ucc.org, scrolling all the way down, and all of those upcoming events will be in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And as we close, I wanna invite the General Minister and President of the United Church of Christ, to lead us out in prayer. Let us all pray. 
Holy Spirit of the living God and the risen Christ, as disciples of the one whom we know as love, and the one who created us in love. You have built us for the long journey. It is our desire as faithful disciples and stewards of your love that all that we do be an extension of your vision of shalom in the world, the ushering in of a beloved community. The days are long and nights are hard. And all that is expected us of us as we contribute our little toils of love can grow wearying. And what's more wearying than the actual work itself is the sometimes uh, feeling of helplessness and hopelessness that what we did didn't matter or make a difference. So we simply ask for two things the courage to endure in the struggle when sometimes the outcomes are not obvious and the assurance that with every step we take in love, proclaiming love, you abide. With this, we offer to you once again, our whole heart, mind, soul, body, and strength in the proclamation of your good news of redeeming and transformative love. Be with us on the journey, we pray. This is our humble prayer. We offer it your most holy name. Amen.